for a lot of us, it was just, you know, blew our mind. That's one of the most important films ever made, I think. Nothing lasts. In 1968, one daring film took the world on the ultimate trip and provided a blueprint for America's voyage to space. When the astronauts in real life got to the moon and were asked what it looked like, they said it looks just like 2001. In 1969, when Richard Nixon asked his space advisors, what are we going to do after Project Apollo? They basically came back with 2001 A Space Odyssey. How 2001 inspired our exploration of the cosmos, reinvented science fiction, alerted us to the dangers of artificial intelligence, and emboldened the human race to continue its search for something greater than itself. 2001 made me feel that this was indeed the future, that technology was coming and it was going to be unbelievably exciting. Whether you were a fan of the film or not, you expected 2001 to be this cataclysmic event. What is our place in the universe? And that's what 2001 did, perhaps better than any other film, even to this day, is create a sense of genuine mystery about what, what the hell is going on. 2001, A Space Odyssey, up next on Movies That Shook the World. Hollywood spends $10 billion a year making movies. Some hit, some miss, some shake the world. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. In April of 1968, 2001, A Space Odyssey launched into theaters across the country. The buzz about that film was so extraordinary. 2001 was the most anticipated picture of its time. But at its world premiere, the masterpiece that would go down in history as one of the greatest films of all time was deemed less than stellar. A quarter to a third of the audience walked out. Rock Hudson walked right past me saying, well, somebody tell me what the hell this movie is about. The film was critically panned, like bad. Like people said it was a piece of There was one critique that said he deserved corporal punishment. I think that's a bad review. People did not know or didn't seem to realize they had seen one of the greatest films ever made. 2001 would survive the early condemnations and inspire an unlikely audience, in part because it captured the dreams of a nation. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. It was obvious that we needed to explore space. And when Kennedy gave that speech, it was terribly encouraging that here was somebody that was positively seeking our future and realizing that part of our future was to escape this planet. But part of the impetus for that lofty goal was America's bitter competition with the Soviet Union. Well, during the 60s, it was a very pioneering time. We were still in the midst of the uh, Cold War evolving, uh, nuclear confrontation. There was a lot of concern. It was a concern that emerging director Stanley Kubrick felt keenly and would eventually address in 2001 A Space Odyssey. But first, he focused on the nuclear arms race on Earth in his acclaimed Cold War satire, Dr. Strangelove. He established himself as a film director before he was still sort of considered a child wonder. And uh, this gave him the ticket for independence. Dr. Strangelove, I mean, that was an indictment, you know, of, you know, Cold War politics. Where's my shorts? Ah! Where's the bathroom? On the hotline. Dr. Strangelove. Well, Stanley Kubrick obviously was following Cold War issues very closely in the early 1960s. And Dr. Strangelove is a classic example of a statement of how insane some of this can get. As the Cold War exploded into the uncharted territory of space, Kubrick's next project would capture the excitement and terror of the space race, a race the U.S. was losing. In 1957, when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, it was a shot across the bow, and Americans felt it very keenly. The course of United States policies in the competition with Russia has been severely shaken. It's very frightening that they have atomic weapons. It becomes doubly frightening when they have a delivery system. This is the awesome picture of doom, the devastating course of nuclear power unleashed by man. To make matters worse, America's initial response, the launch of the Vanguard satellite in 1957, proved catastrophic. 
and from the 50s through the really throughout the 60s the soviet union beat the united states to every major first a stunned flabbergasted america promised to catch up we have not in the real world space technology shot forward at a dizzying pace but on the screen science fiction remained mired in cartoonish fantasy kubrick longed to bring it into sync with reality what do we do our only chance is a flash between them before they meet I think I probably saw all science fiction films. Mm. And so did Stanley, and so did many other people who wouldn't confess to it. The time has come to direct all further attacks against the planet Earth. We were all hooked on science fiction, secretly. And up to that point, science fiction was mainly ray guns and guys in rubber suits running around, really. Laughable things and slightly embarrassing. It was almost like making a porn film to make, say, making science fiction. They're tightening! I can't breathe! And Stanley thought it would be good to make one that cuts through this prejudice. To reinvent the genre, Kubrick needed an expert advisor who shared his passion for inserting genuine science into science fiction. He found a kindred spirit in popular English sci-fi author and renowned scientist Arthur C. Clarke. All the evidence the last few years suggests that life is inevitable in any environment which is halfway suitable for it. Arthur Clarke hit like a bombshell with this uh, book called Childhood's End. And to talk to him was for Stanley just wonderful. Stanley was so pleased to have advice that he felt had real grounding and that he wouldn't make a fool of himself. And I don't think he did. Arthur Clarke's involvement in a major theatrical picture like this is truly unique because this is a guy who, while an author, is also heavily entrenched with, with the, the scientific community. After pouring through thousands of pages of Clarke's earlier work, the duo agreed to base their film on one of the author's short stories, The Sentinel. Kubrick saw something in Clark's idea that not even Clark himself saw and was able to expand upon it and visualize it in a way that no one else but Kubrick could have done. Kubrick and Clark spent a year hammering out ideas. By 1964, they had a 130-page manuscript and a green light from MGM. As production began, Kubrick spared no expense for the utmost in scientific accuracy. There were all kinds of advisors, I mean, NASA advisors. There were about 40 different corporations involved that sent specialists. He wanted to know every area. Remember, we hadn't had the first shot of the Earth yet, so there was long debates of what would the Earth look like. In 1959, for the first time, NASA develops what is called the Long Range Plan. It's a 10-year projection of what we want to try to do in space. Clark became privy to those, and so those get reflected in the realities that they try to express in 2001 Space Odyssey. There are so many iconic moments in the film um, that are part of our vernacular as a culture. The single finest edit in all of movies is in that movie. Kubrick also proved visionary in creating Hal, a computer with human emotions and a murderous mind of his own. In a rage, Hal kills most of the ship's astronauts. To have this computer character that reaps vengeance upon uh, one of the astronauts out of fear, you know, he's showing more emotion, I think, than the human characters are in many respects. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. And that, to the end, when Hal is singing, you know, Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer to. It draws you in because you're kind of going, is this machine dying? And you actually feel a little something for it. Stunning. Stunning. Kubrick was famous for his cinematic vision, but infamous for his closed sets and inflated budgets. I remember Stanley thundering down the phone, defending, attacking, and explaining continuously. If I were an MGM executive with a director of Kubrick's reputation and someone's basically hiding what he's doing as, as he was, I would uh, oh no, kiss this investment goodbye. It is everything that scares studios. It's something that's difficult to understand. It's a filmmaker who doesn't like to share what they're doing. And the end result is something that everyone interprets differently and no one can agree on. They were 
worried. Yeah, I think they were very worried. <laughs> and so was he. Coming up, 2001 struggles to right its ship at the box office with an untapped market. All of a sudden, there was a champion in their midst, and that was this film. And inspires the American space program. And Nixon said, pick one of the things that's in the movie that's a human spaceflight initiative, and I'll approve that. 2001 blasts off when movies that shook the world returns. Stanley Kubrick's 2001, A Space Odyssey, had visualized the reality of space travel. But to Kubrick's horror, early press screenings for the critics proved disastrous. They left in droves. It was a terrible reaction by the audience. The story was a compromising. It was a very difficult story. It was very slow to reveal itself. And it was an art film. The ending was, was mystifying, uh, a real head scratcher. <laughs> The rebirth, the old age, the travel, the isolation. People always say, oh, I don't care about the reviews. He cared desperately, and he hated himself for caring so much. Fearing a public backlash, as brutal as the critical reaction, Kubrick cut 19 minutes from his space odyssey just before the film's wide release. Stanley had practically lost his voice with exhaustion, and I just fell asleep and woke up to hear a uh, disc jockey saying, people are standing around the block, this is a fantastic film. Here's this movie that, you know, the mainstream critics just didn't get it, but this, uh, this underground culture was saying, you've got to see this, this is just amazing. Driving this box office revival was a generation of young hippies whose passion for the film spoke to the turbulent years that preceded its release. 1968 was the ultimate nightmare year for the United States. Martin Luther King was killed on April 5th. And then just a few weeks later, uh, Robert F. Kennedy was killed. It was the year of the Tet Offensive when most people became convinced that we couldn't win the war in Vietnam. One of the reasons I think that teenagers and the counterculture embraced 2001 was it definitely said, you know, there is a future and it can be changed. Played for months or years, and uh, they would go back again and again for a Hollywood movie to be. Uh, about spacecraft and the future be treated as a hippie artifact. It was such a peculiar response. Probably because they smoked one before they went in. But they certainly loved spaceships, man. People were smoking funny cigarettes or taking funny um, little white pills or whatever, you know, and, and tripping out on this film. I probably didn't need to smoke, but I did. Kids actually lay on the floor in front of the screen to see that sound and light trip when Dave Bowman goes through space and time. I don't think the MGM marketing team was necessarily targeting the counterculture to begin with, but when they saw that the hippies were going to 2001 in droves, I think that's when the ultimate trip tagline came about. The movie became an ultimate artifact of the 1960s drug culture. But psychedelics weren't the only trip that defined 2001. The hippie generation also saw it as a form of alternative spirituality. A lot of churches were very establishmentarian, and kids didn't like that. So people were beginning to investigate alternative spiritual paths. Maybe God isn't this great-faced dude with a beard, you know, sitting on this throne. Maybe God was this incredibly positive energy, and there it is in space, and we're moving towards it. What's wonderful about it is you can actually make a case in looking at the film for that being what it is. People with a faith feel protected, and those without a faith long for something. For some, 2001 reimagined the divine. For others, it indelibly marked how they viewed the physical heavens. For the time, it was the best picture of what the Earth looked like from space, and it was entirely created in the studio. You bought it. You bought the ships, you bought the suits, you bought the station, you bought all of the equipment, you bought everything. They did it beautifully. The lunar footage on 2001 is very impressive because we had not yet been there. And you forget now, because you see it, and you assume we had already been there. It picked up on that suspense. Are we going to make it? Is it going to happen? Ten, nine, ignition sequence start. Six. We have 2001 coming out just in the uh, epitome, the excitement of who's going to get to the moon first. 
next comes the real moon landing. The fact is, we were already prepared for it from 2001. 75 feet, that's looking good down a half. So when Neil Armstrong actually stepped there, people thought back to 2001 and said, yeah, I know what it's like to there. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Not only did, in, did 2001 tap into the space vibe that was going on in, in American culture at that time, the space race, it launched a whole new generation of people fascinated by space travel. Opening the public's eyes to the images of space, it also inspired many to unleash their imaginations in the real world of science and technology. When I talked to people in the aerospace defense industries after they saw that movie, and this was in the mid-70s that I started this conversation, what inspired you? And frequently I would hear Arthur C. Clarke, the 2001 Space Odyssey movie, because that was where many of us first got turned on to the visuals of what was possible in space. One mark of a first-rate scientist is an interest in science fiction, and conversely, one mark of a second-rate scientist is a lack of interest in science fiction. I can't tell you how many 45, 50 year old guys come to me and say, I started my own computer company because, or the guys in our company name our computer Hal. I mean, that is a huge undercurrent. But perhaps most influential was 2001's effect on the development of America's space program. In 1969, when Richard Nixon, the newly inaugurated president, asked his space advisors, what are we going to do after Project Apollo? They basically came back with 2001 A Space Odyssey. It became an interesting and useful kind of public marker of what is possible. Nixon rejected it. Nixon, Nixon said, we can't afford it, and he said, basically, pick one. Pick one of the things that's in the movie that's a human spaceflight initiative, and I'll approve that. So the wing space shuttle you see, actually run by Pan Am in the movie, was what NASA selected to spend the 1970s developing. And that, of course, is what we have today in the modern space shuttle. The realism of the film and the, its realistic approach probably will never be done again quite in that way until i hope one day someone like james cameron takes a damn film crew into outer space and makes a movie in orbit coming up in 1968 2001 changed the world and the space around it but would its vision hold up at the turn of the century 2001 had a futuristic utopian ring to it it's lost it now hasn't it mm. The real-life legacy of 2001 blasts into the 21st century. And liftoff of the Delta II rocket carrying the spirit from Earth to planet Mars. When Movies That Shook the World returns. In 1968, 2001 A Space Odyssey emerged as the third highest grossing film of the year. But the movie that was initially shunned by critics continued to gather steam as the real 2001 drew near. You come out of a Kubrick movie, you're thinking about it for years and years and years. And you still don't know why. You can go back and watch 2001 and it still stands out as being just as unique and just as provocative as it was when it came out in 1968. But as the clock struck midnight in the year 2000, 2001 became a reality. Many looked around and wondered if 2001 really was just a movie. When 2001 came around, in Washington, D.C., and in NASA in particular, there were a lot of people who said, gee, we really got a lot of work to do to catch up with the movie. We don't have uh, Pan Am going to orbit around uh, the Earth. We have no moon base, doesn't exist, not going to exist in the short term anyway. There is, however, a space station. It was up uh, by the year 2000, and so it was in place. Strikingly different from the one depicted in the film, but nonetheless, it did exist. What they got right was a lot of stuff. The importance of computers in everyday life was really visionary. We don't have how, but we each have not only our own computers, but our own personal devices that can communicate to other people on the other side of the world instantaneously. We have so many satellites up there that you probably couldn't go for a walk in space without bumping into one. 
and now we have spirit and opportunity on Mars and I know you talk to the Mars scientists they believe that those are just the precursors uh, to humans going. 2001 a Space Odyssey has energized a whole segment of the population to be excited about flying in space and what the potential for the future might be. It did it in 1968, it's still doing it today. We will build new ships to carry man forward into the universe, to gain a new foothold on the moon, and to prepare for new journeys to the worlds beyond our own. NASA calls it the vision for space exploration, where much of what you see in the movie is presumably going to come true. In 1968, 2001, A Space Odyssey visualized the hopes and dreams of a generation. But its message has continued to inspire the generation of tomorrow. You can show it to a group of kids in college or high school, and they will walk away from it with a new sense of excitement for the possibilities that might exist for the future. And I can't think of anything that's much better than that. This movie tapped into a creativity in so many of us that we didn't even know we had because we kept watching it and going further and further and further out. And we realized that there are no limits. We're going out to find out what the f is going on. You know, what is happening? What is our place in the universe? And that's what 2001 did perhaps better than any other film, even to this day, is create a sense of genuine mystery about what, what the hell is going on. Just have to think big, not small. In 1968, 2001 A Space Odyssey emerged as the third highest grossing film of the year. But the movie that was initially shunned by critics continued to gather steam as the real 2001 drew near. You come out of a Kubrick movie, you're thinking about it for years and years and years. And you still don't know why. You can go back and watch 2001 and it still stands out as being just as unique and just as provocative as it was when it came out in 1968. But as the clock struck midnight in the year 2000, 2001 became a reality. Many looked around and wondered if 2001 really was just a movie. When 2001 came around, in Washington, D.C., and in NASA in particular, there were a lot of people who said, gee, we've really got a lot of work to do to catch up with the movie. We don't have uh, Pan Am going to orbit around uh, the Earth. We have no moon base, doesn't exist, not going to exist in the short term anyway. There is, however, a space station. It was up uh, by the year 2000, and so it was in place. Strikingly different from the one depicted in the film, but nonetheless, it did exist. What they got right was a lot of stuff. The importance of computers in everyday life was really visionary. We don't have how, but we each have not only our own computers, but our own personal devices that can communicate to other people on the other side of the world instantaneously. We have so many satellites up there that you probably couldn't go for a walk in space without bumping into one. And now we have spirit and opportunity on Mars. And I know you talk to the Mars scientists, they believe that those are just the precursors uh, to humans going. 2001 a Space Odyssey has energized a whole segment of the population to be excited about flying in space and what the potential for the future might be. It did it in 1968, it's still doing it today. We will build new ships to carry man forward into the universe, to gain a new foothold on the moon, and to prepare for new journeys to the worlds beyond our own. NASA calls it the vision for space exploration, where much of what you see in the movie is presumably going to come true. In 1968, 2001, A Space Odyssey visualized the hopes and dreams of a generation. But its message has continued to inspire the generation of tomorrow. You can show it to a group of kids in college or high school, and they will walk away from it with a new sense of excitement for the possibilities that might exist for the future. And I can't think of anything that's much better than that. This movie tapped into a creativity in so many of us that we didn't even know we had because we kept watching it and going further and further and further out. And we realized that there are no limits. We're going out to find out what the f 
that's going on. You know, what is happening? What is our place in the universe? And that's what 2001 did perhaps better than any other film, even to this day, is create a sense of genuine mystery about what, what the hell is going on. Just have to think big, not small.